Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. You're listening to Healthcare Matters, the podcast that pulls back the curtain to help you make sense of complex healthcare economics and policy issues. With us, as always, is Dr. Robert Popovian, joining us from Washington, D.C. He's a pharmacist, he's an economist, and he's the chief science policy officer at the Global Healthy Living Foundation. And joining me is my good friend, Connor Mertens in Seattle, Washington, my co-host and our patient advocate and community outreach manager. Connor, interesting times. No more Pete Carroll in the sidelines of the Seattle Seahawks. What's going on? It's been a weird, weird month for Seattle sports and Seattle football specifically, hasn't it? Absolutely. For the entire college and NFL landscape. Exactly. So, Connor, let's start this episode. I have an important number I want to share with you, and that number is 2.9 million. What does that mean to you? I'll give you a hint. It has to do with the COVID infection, and it's probably a number you haven't heard in the news yet because the study just came out earlier this year. 2.9 million has to do with COVID I'm going to go with the amount of sourdough that was made during the pandemic. That was everyone's thing, right? Everyone was making sourdough. That is true. We were all home and waiting to get out of the house and nothing else to do but cook. So, no, the 2.9 million, actually, you know, I was part of this research that was released by the Progressive Policy Institute. It was a paper written by myself, Michael Mandel, who's the chief economist for PPI, and Wayne Weingarten, who's the chief economist for the Pacific Research Institute. So I was one of the three authors. Some of our audience knows anyways. I'm a senior health policy fellow at Progressive Policy Institute, besides being the chief science policy officer at Global Healthy Living Foundation. And, you know, the 2.9 million was really the fatalities that were avoided due to the rapid development of the vaccine. We did some nuanced actually analysis in this paper that we came up with about 3.3 million because we estimated not only the rapid development, but the efficacy rate as well as getting the shot in the arms of the patients. So yeah, 2.9 to 3.3 million is the number of fatalities that was avoided because we were able to as a country, as an industry with biopharmaceutical industry to develop and distribute this vaccine for COVID-19. Well, I mean, it sounds like this is a pretty complex study, a lot of big numbers, a lot of moving parts. Can you just give us a, a brief summary of what these findings were? Well, yeah, it was written by three economists. I assume it was complex, but I have to say, even though it was written by three economists, it was written by a policy institute, it's a very good, easy read, and I would encourage everybody to visit the show notes and we'll put a tag to the paper. But let's summarize, like, what did we find in our paper? We estimated that between 2.9 and 3.3 million fatalities have been avoided because of this rapid development and distribution of the vaccine. 12.5 million hospitalizations have been avoided, which is significant because not everybody ended up dying, but a lot of people were hospitalized. So because of this rapid development of the vaccine, 12.5 million hospitalizations were avoided. We saved, as an economy in the U.S., $500 billion, and it's primarily because of the avoided hospitalizations. And, uh, you know, we had very moderate estimations of what the cost of those hospitalizations were, and $500 billion was saved because of this development. But there are a couple other things that we looked at. We looked at specifically at boosters, because that's a big issue now. The latest booster is out. Not too many people are getting boosted up, but it's out there. We estimated that patients who don't get boosters, and the ones that get repeated boosters, and there's everybody else falls somewhere in between probably, there's 6.2 times more greater fatality rate for patients who avoid the boosters, who are not getting any of the boosters. So your likelihood is about 6.2 times more to die from COVID if you're not being boosted up. And finally, one of the things that we estimated, we looked at specifically what age group the boosters benefits the most, both economically and from a efficacy standpoint. Well, 500 billion, that's nothing to to shake your fist at. That's a lot of money. And and we've talked about on the show before that vaccines are, if not the most effective preventative treatment for healthcare, keeping people out of the most cost effective, rather, way for keeping people out of the hospital. So you just kind of started to allude to it. But who's benefiting and who benefited? Because we're looking retrospectively most from the development of the COVID vaccine. 
Without a doubt, our study shows, and other studies have demonstrated the same, it's really based on age. Age is a very big factor of who benefits from immunization. And it's not something new, it's not something shocking, but because we've seen the same similar data with flu and pneumococcal and other type of immunization, generally it's the elderly. It's the people who have multiple chronic diseases or immunocompromised who benefit the most from immunization, both from an efficacy standpoint with regards to outcomes, but also from an economic standpoint. We can save significant amount of money when you look at 60 and older patients who are being provided the vaccine compared to lower age brackets. But, you know, it's not a surprise to anyone that older people benefit the most from immunization. One of the hot topics during COVID and controversial in some regards is the idea of herd immunity or natural immunity. And I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit more about did your research show us anything about that? And and what does that mean for vaccinations? We did use it as an assumption in our study. And the assumption has been proven correct since the COVID infection came about in 2020, that herd immunity is equally as efficacious as the immunization. Having said that, and that was one of the assumptions that we did in the modeling our study and are looking at a paper. Having said that, Connor, we've talked about this before in our podcast. For any individual, you, myself, Ben, to gain natural immunity, we have to go through the disease. So you technically have to get sick to gain that immunity versus with immunization, you bypass that illness. And with that illness also comes potential fatality or hospitalization. So yes, theoretically, without a doubt, data confirms that if you are gain natural immunity through getting sick, yes, it is as efficacious as getting the vaccine. But what people don't want to talk about who are anti-vaxxers or don't want to debate is the thing that you have to get sick to get that natural immunity and you have to go through the sickness and take the risk of a fatality or hospitalization before coming out at the back end, having gained this natural immunity, which is then equal with vaccination. And that's what vaccinations generally do. You avoid that illness, you avoid the potential bad outcome, and you get to the back end having gained immunity toward a very deadly disease. And when we talk about the financial ramifications of that and why we always talk about how vaccinations are the most cost-effective preventative tool that we have, if somebody goes through the sickness and they end up in the hospital, then those are bills that add up and those are costs that add up, whereas it costs pennies on the dollar to make these vaccines that can prevent the treatment and and bypass it and get straight to that immunity. I'm curious, what about long-term COVID? You didn't really talk about long-term COVID in this research, did you? Was that something that came up? We didn't look at long-term COVID in this paper because there's still a lot of like data that's coming out on long-term COVID and there's a lot of controversy, but the recent study that just came out and, you know, it was shared with us by one of our colleagues has to do with boosters and long COVID. And what the study finds is that patients who have been boosted and immunized fully technically have a lower incidence of long COVID, even if they get infection. Because remember, with vaccination, you still get infected from time to time. You get the flu vaccine, you may still end up with the flu, but the severity of illness is not as much. And the same thing has been found out with COVID is that with long COVID, if you've been boosted regularly and you've received your regular vaccination for COVID, the chances of long COVID is much lower than patients who have not been regularly boosted or did not receive any of the original vaccination schedule. So again, we didn't look at it in our study that was published, but there's other studies had recently come out, was shared with us, has to do with boosters, and also that there's a correlation between patients who have been boosted and the lower incidence of long COVID. Well, let's bring it back to our patients and the community that we work with here at the Global Healthy Living Foundation. How do we protect patients that think that the vaccine doesn't work as well? Like, how can we help them? Oh, boy. So (laughs) loaded question, (laughs) loaded question, because it's not a policy solution, Connor, in my opinion. And we'd like talking policy here and data and uh, legislation all the time. But this is not a policy issue. I think with vaccines, we need to go back to the basics. 
But what we've seen in the, over the last couple of years, this past year specifically, is that immunization rate for even adults, even older adults, has dropped in the United States. There's this hesitancy about vaccines. There's this apprehension by patients to go be immunized. And we almost need to go back to the basics of ensuring, teaching, advocating for vaccination. Because the last thing you want to do, especially the troubling numbers are within the older adults that are not only not getting their, perhaps their COVID boosters, but they're also not getting their flu vaccine. And that's troubling or pneumococcal vaccine. And that's what we need to start doing is going back to the basics, really talking to patients, talking to them, not mandating stuff, not wagging our fingers, but talking to them and educating them on the benefits of the immunization. And hopefully this podcast and our efforts at GHLF will go a long way to be able to do that. And it's with a sad heart that I have to say this, because again, you've heard me say it a million times. You just said it. Vaccines are the most cost-effective intervention ever developed in healthcare. And we've almost lost our way in the last few years about what the benefits are. And we need to go back to the basics. Well, I think you'll be happy to hear I had a doctor's appointment Tuesday this week, and I got four different vaccines, and my arm is feeling pretty sore today. But it's nice having that peace of mind. You said it earlier, we love to talk policy here. So I guess then my last question has to be about, based on your findings, are there policy recommendations we could propose for future health strategies, especially in light of new variants and the needs for boosters that are constantly evolving? I think the strategy needs to be, we need to be prepared because I don't think people saw COVID coming. We were not well prepared as a country. Thankfully, the private sector stood up and was able to get the immunizations out and treatments out quickly. And it's not only the vaccines, but also the oral antivirals, the antibody therapies that are available for patients. I think we need to be more prepared. There's going to be more breakouts. We had a very rough uh, respiratory season this last year. Everybody I knew was sick. I got sick, even though I had my flu vaccine and I had my COVID vaccine, I didn't have flu nor COVID. It was something else. So we need to be on our toes. We need to be aware of these things that are circulating around. And a lot of times we take that for granted, I can tell you. And from a policy perspective, we need to be better prepared, better funded for types of outbreaks that we're going to be facing. And it's not just COVID or flu or pneumococcal. It's other things that are coming that we don't even know about. Well, Robert, you know how we do things around here. I'm going to make sure you get the last word. But, you know, what I take away is this was a very thorough study and, and we learned a lot of really good things. Not only did we save millions of lives through this proven effective vaccine, but we saved a lot of money, too. And, and that's taxpayer money and that's out of pocket money. That's five hundred billion dollars um, that could be used for other things. So keep getting the vaccine, keep funding the vaccine research, and we'll continue to see these lives saved and this money saved. But let's make sure you get the last word. What do you think? No, we Without a doubt, I mean, what you said was perfect, right? We saved lives through the rapid vaccine development and also not only the development, but getting shots in the arms, right? We saved a lot of money because of that and we can't lose sight of that. And we cannot go back to the days that we are really hesitant about immunization because COVID is one infection. There are many other infections out there and we need to protect our patients, especially our most vulnerable patients who happen to be elderly or immunocompromised. As always, thanks for breaking that down for us, Robert. I think there's some very valuable information in there for our listeners. And to our listeners, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you might be listening so you never miss an episode. If you have a second, help spread the word by rating our podcast, writing a positive review, and sharing with your friends and family. It'll help more people like you find us. If you have any questions, thoughts, suggestions, comments, please send it to us via email to podcasts at ghlf.org. We want to hear from you. And in fact, you may be featured on one of our upcoming episodes like we've done with other guests. And before you go, make sure to take a listen to some of the other great podcasts on the GHLF Podcast Network. You can find all of GHLF's podcasts at ghlf.org forward slash listen. As always, he's Dr. Robert Popovian. And he's Connor Mertens. See you all next time. Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. Thank you.